that's humming. I am thine, O Lord. I turn to 314. All right, if you will take your hymnals, turn over to page number 17. Page number 17. Let's sing Come Thou Fount. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Verse 2. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fault of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood and the last oh to grace how great a debtor daily i'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to wander lord i feel it Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Dad? All right, thank you guys. The message tonight deals with human rights. What do you think about that? In the last, if you remember... Weeks ago, months ago, we dealt with a term called contextualization. It's a fancy term that means as missionaries would go into various countries and they had to learn the nature and the culture of their people. And sometimes it's been weeks, months, ten years with them before they ever won one convert because they had to learn how to relate to them. Well, America is a mission field, and the gods that America worship are difficult gods to understand because there's about 330 million of them in America. Do you know what I mean by that? Every man's doing what's right in their own eyes. So how do you deal with a people who don't even know it, that they reject God. Many that are very religious and yet humanized, and then many that think that we who believe in Jesus Christ and His resurrection, that we're just not smart at all. We're foolish in our thinking. So how do we relate to them? And how we relate is first we have to know our enemy. If you don't know Satan's tactics, he'll trip you every day, every moment. He really will. So we have to know our enemy. Uh, some of the great generals in the military studied their enemy's tactics, their warfare. And they would say, if I know how they're going to fight, I know how to defeat them. Any coach for any team that's any good gets the tapes of the other team and watches how they play and sets up a defense and an offense, how to overcome them. Well, America has another religion today, and it's not Christianity. And that religion we've been talking about the last three weeks, this is the fourth week, called humanism. And the first two tenets, it dealt with religion. And if you were here, if you have your booklet to reread it, it just showed you and I how they really hate our God. 
and they hate our beliefs, and they hate our Bible, and they don't believe in faith and the supernatural and the hereafter, and they just, they just hate everything about our God. And then last week, we actually took two of the tenets and put them together and it dealt with ethics or morals. And they told us last week the morals that we should have. Now, when you don't have morals, do you know what type of morals you're going to tell someone to have? <laughs> and so we dealt with that last week. And this week we come to this, human rights. And I want to talk to you, show you some doctrine first about human rights. And then we will go and show you where they are. But I always want to go to the Bible first so you know, thus saith the Lord is true even though they reject these thoughts. God, guide, and direct, bless. As we look at your word, in Christ's name we pray, amen. Um, the first one is this, a doctrine, a scripture. You and I, when God made us, he made us very special. No other creature in the universe is like man. Now, if you're a humanist, you don't believe that. You don't believe there's any difference than an animal and man. You don't think there's any difference in a fetus and a real baby. You have more value over a bald eagle than a human being being born. You see what I'm saying? And so that's why we got these crazy rules in humanism today, all right? And so here's to show how special you are. You were created in the image of God. And God said, let us make man our own image after our own likeness and let him have dominion over everything. When you were created, you were created, get this, to mirror God. That when people look in your face, in my face, they're supposed to see God. When they hear me talk and you talk, they're supposed to hear God. When they see my actions and your actions, they're supposed to see God. That's why we were made. Wow. Not only that, God gave us dominance over everything in the world. What a right we have. These are our rights. To mirror God, that's a right. To have domination over the whole earth, that's a right. Thirdly, man was made to live forever. How about that? And the Lord said, you know, as long as you don't eat of that tree, you'll live forever, but the day you eat, you'll die. So no other creature was made to live forever but man on the earth, okay? But we're still going to live forever even though we sin, either in heaven or hell. But see, this is a teaching that the humanists don't want you to even think about or accept. Thirdly, man was created a trinity. You're made unique. God formed you out of the dust of the earth. And then he made you a spirit. He breathed into your nostrils a breath of life. And then you became a living soul. You're a trinity, an amazing creature that God has made. The humanists hate that. Because they don't believe you have an eternal spirit. God says you do have an eternal spirit. So if you're just no different than a goat, or a cockroach, or a monkey, or a tortoise, then if the population gets too large, you just cut back the population. See how they think. Then, man was created for this biggest reason, to have fellowship with God. We find that in 1 John, where John said, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you may have fellowship that I uh, heard unto you that you also may have fellowship with him. And truly our fellowship is with who? The Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. That's why we were created. We're, we're special. Man is special. But what if you're taught that you're no different than the polywog you came from? Wow. Interesting, is it not? All right. Thus man was created by the Creator, like his Creator, and for his creator, he was given the rights and privileges to have dominion over the world as he walked under the authority of God, his creator. He was made to fellowship with God and walk in obedience to him. They get ahead of me here. But then man sinned. Man sinned. And when man sinned, he lost his righteousness and he lost his his rights. A dead man has no rights. And man without Christ is a dead man. And the humanist wants to give all these rights to dead people. Who can't think spiritually. They can't see spiritually. They can't even react spiritually. So what are they going to do? 
they're going to do some bad things, which you see in our country already. Ezekiel tells us this about man after he sinned, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Paul said, all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jeremiah said about the unsaved man, the heart's deceitful above all, everything else, and desperately wicked. You don't even know your own heart. And not unless you're really close to God as a Christian can you detect what's wrong with your heart. So the Bible is, wow, it's tough, but yet it reveals truth to us. Now man needs something special. What does he need? He needs Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and 22, the Bible says, For in Adam we all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive. So when we're in Christ, we get our rights back. Our rights to be conformed to His image again. Our rights to, as we live righteously, have dominion over the earth again. Our rights to fellowship with God again. You see, our rights is not the rights that the humanists have thrown upon the public the last hundred years and gone beyond even what's ethical in those rights. What we have today is responsibilities. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Let me give you three of our responsibilities. Number one, in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Jesus said, This is the greatest responsibility man will ever have. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. Your responsibility in mind. What if you were raised in a home where mom and daddy taught you that the first thing you do when you get up in the morning is you go into the bathroom and you take your shower and you wash your hair and you brush your teeth and you get ready for the day. That's what most people do. But what if you were never taught that? Then you probably wouldn't do it. And this is where we failed in Christendom. We failed as parents, as preachers, to say, look, the most important thing in your life is to fall in love with Jesus Christ. Responsibility. Second most important thing is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Why, preacher, are those so important? Because every letter in that Bible hinges on those two laws being kept. And if you don't keep those two laws, the rest of the Bible will fall apart. And the humanists knew this. So they've infiltrated our minds, our hearts, our souls, our homes, our schools, our political system, and they've taught us so many horrible, horrible lies. Hmm. How we love God and others will be judged one day. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we, we must all appear before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that hath he done. Whether it be, isn't it interesting, isn't it? Good or bad, Christian, this is to us, good or bad. I thought, preacher, after we got saved, we couldn't do bad. You know better than that. That you got saved, you did bad. <laughs> you still blew it. And so there'll be a judgment. And then one more verse that means a lot, and get this verse, just I, I want you to get it in your heart. Why were you created? For by him were all things created, that's in heaven, that's in earth, visible, invisible, whether it be thrones, that's spiritual things, Dominion, spiritual beings, principalities, spiritual beings, powers, those refer to spiritual beings, angelic beings, creations of God. All things, including man, were created by him and for him. You don't belong to yourself. I don't belong to myself. No one on the face of the earth belongs to themselves. But most people think they do, so they're walking the way they want to walk. And yet, according to God's word, we have been created by him for his glory. The man that has the proper knowledge of God knows God is holy. And man is condemned to die for his sins. Therefore the wise man knows he must be humbled before God. That was a scripture. Did you have a prayer meeting? That was a scripture. If you really want to pray and get your prayers answered, you've got to be humbled. That means you can't think little of yourself. It means you can't think of yourself at all. No more pity parties. No more poor me. But if you come to that place where you love him, it's now God, what can I do for you? The Holy Spirit within man teaches him that he's responsible to God. 
The day you get saved, you no longer declare your rights. You realize, I have responsibilities. And every word and action and attitude and motive that I display in life, I have to give account for before God someday. The humanist teaches your children in our nation, no God. You can live the way you want to please. And that's what people are doing today. And they don't understand that they're burying themselves in false teachings and even in false religions. The humanist has been taught that man deserves rights beyond biblical rights. That his parents owe him something. That society owes him something. Nobody owes anybody anything. You owe God everything. That's the way it ought to be looked at. That's God's Word. Well, a little bit of history if I can. Uh, from the 1800s to the 1920s, uh, uh, some of you know this, there was a fight uh, for women rights, okay? Women rights. Uh, in England, you can, a woman could not own property to 1935. Women in America could, learn, could own property in the early 1800s. Isn't that good, ladies? Y'all really come a long ways, haven't you? Uh, 1919, women were given the right to vote. They could not vote in America till then. I think that's fair, don't you? I think women all have the right to vote, don't you? But I'm saying, just think about society. And, and, and you say, preacher, why did all these right things come about? You'll see in a minute. Then in 1948, we had the human rights movement. Why do we have that? Because the way the Germans and the Japanese tortured, mutilated, and murdered human beings. I think every human being ought to be taught, treated the same, don't you? I like what Martin Luther King said, and I didn't think I'd ever quote him, but let me quote him to you, okay? He said this, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the contents of their character. Well, I have the same thing to say for white people. Our character. Our character. I think you ought to get a job because of your character. I think you ought to be promoted because of your character. I think your character will put you where you ought to be in life. Especially your spiritual character. Because if you've got God on your side, man, you're staying in real good shape there, okay? So we had women rights, we had human rights, we had civil rights. Now, some people fuss about civil rights. You know, folks, the civil rights was fought from the 1700s in Europe to, well, it really came ahead on Abraham Lincoln, you know the story. And finally, in, 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 in the Civil War, gave uh, the black man the right to, you know, work, but there were still some tremendous prejudices there. In 1964, the Civil Rights Movement came to give more rights to the black man. But let me say this, what Martin Luther King taught, if it was lived by his race, this would be a good country. But they're not living it because the humanists have taken it over. He even said this, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Man, that's good. But if you're filled with hatred and prejudices toward anybody, if you're bitter towards a, if you're a white person, bitter towards a white person, your hatred is going to keep you from showing the image of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Interesting thoughts. The golden rule is this. I like it. Jesus said it. I think we'll live it, don't you? He said, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even also to them. I think that's right. You know, don't you like that? Talk to somebody, and I wish I could get every daddy to talk to their wives the way they want their wives to talk to them. And every wife to talk to her husband the way she wants her husband to talk to her. And every parent to talk to their teenagers the way they should have talked to them when they were little. Because when they become teenagers, they may talk to you the way you talked to them when they were little. Well, that's a great rule, don't you think so? You know, and we should be taught that rule. Now, let me tell you why what's happened with the rights movement over the many, many years. In some 
cases, people cried for equality because they weren't treated right. And I agree. I, I, they, a lot of people weren't treated right, including women, including the black race, including... Folks, look, thank God you don't live in the Middle East because you, dear precious ladies, wouldn't have anything. Won't get into that. In some cases, people were not content in living according to God's Word. And so because they weren't content, they demanded more than they deserved. In some cases, love for God and love for man was lost and people began to live selfish lives. And the humanists came on the scene. And they took the individual rights that the women declared and the, um, the black race declared and even human suffrage as such, human rights declared, and they crossed God's boundary line that says stop right here, and they swung it all the way over here. And now the human rights and the women rights and the liberated rights and everything that's being cried today, if you'll study it compared to God's Word, you'll find most of it is anti-God. So, the pendulum swung past truth to deceit, lies, and sinfulness. Why, preacher? Because since 1933, when the humanists in America heard the saying of Adolf Hitler, they began to practice it. If you say something loud enough, often enough, people will believe it. And so if you tell a lie often enough, loud enough, and long enough, people will believe it. Why are people believing in humanism in America today? You've heard it all your life. Again, you hear it on every television program nearly, and many people, over half the nation, if not two-thirds, hears it from their preacher every Sunday morning. Interesting. All right, now let's get to the humanist tenets, okay? I put them on the board. They're in your booklet. They may seem very difficult. All I did is I read through them. I meditated upon them. And I'll explain to you what they mean. You can go home if you want to do and do a word study on them out of Webster's Dictionary. And you'll see the fancy terms that they use. You might not understand it completely. But you'll see how they're trying to hang you by your neck. Okay? The fifth tenet of humanism is this. They say the preciousness and dignity of the individual person is a central Humanistic value. Wow, how evil. And that tenet, they just made themselves God. Why, preacher? Because man is not precious. Man is a sinner. Only Jesus Christ's blood is precious. Only God is precious. Only His Spirit is precious. Only those walking with God is precious. The humanist believes he can decide what is right and wrong. The humanist basically worships himself. That's what he's saying in that, that one tenet there. You're of value. Boy, you're important. Man, you know people need to pat you on the back. You need to be promoted. You need to be lifted up. Well, that's humanism. In tenet 5.1, that's why I call it the humanist lie, says every person has their own individual right to say, do, and live as they wish. That's humanism. According to God's Word, you're to... Yield your life to God. You're to walk by truth according to the First Amendment that our forefathers put in our Constitution. They never intended for man to have the right to curse and swear and speak the filth that they speak in the streets of America today. They said that our Constitution was for a Christian people and it could only govern a Christian people. But when you have lost people trying to interpret the congregation that are humanists, they think you have the right to perform any filthy sin you want to perform. So that's why you see why our country is absorbing and allowing some of the dirtiest things in the world to take place. Colossians 1.16 again says, All things were created by God and for God. Number two, the second tenet under the fifth one. Individuals should be encouraged to realize their own creative talents and desires. Wow, what a lie. All mankind is called to repent and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
because their minds are dark and their hearts are sinful. And how can you ask a lost person that has a dark mind, blinded eyes, deaf ears, and a sinful, wicked nature to be creative? His creativity will only lead to more darkness. And yet this is what they teach. Luke 13, the Lord said, I tell you nay, verse 3, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He said the exact same verse again in verse number 6, okay? Thirdly, we reject, and this is the humanist talking, we reject all religious doctrines, ideology, their morality codes. They reject marriage between a husband and a wife. Anything that denigrates us or puts us down, the individual suppresses freedom, dull intellect, or dehumanizes personality. Uh, the verse that came to my mind was Psalms 14.1. The fool has said in his heart, there is, is not in the original Hebrew. No, God, I won't do it your way. I'll do it my way. And then God goes on and says this. That fool, that humanist is corrupt. They've done abominable works. There's none that doeth good. The fool hath rejected God's word. That's what Tenet 5.3 says. The humanist not only rejects God's word, they reject any person that will quote the Bible to them. So if you have a boss man or friend, a neighbor or family member that's been humanized, and you quote the Bible to them, they think you're quoting junk to them because they've already rejected it. So now you've got to sit back and think, okay, how do I witness to them? Very simple. I'll just go ahead and give it to you before I get to the end. If you fall in love with Jesus Christ, and you mirror God to them, when they get around you, they see your love between you and your mate. They see the joy and peace that y'all have. They see the fun in life that you live. They can't argue with that. It's your life versus their life. Simple enough, isn't it? Just perform your responsibilities. And love the Lord thy God with all your heart. And then even though they may mock you and laugh at you and make fun of you and criticize you, you love them just like God loved you. That'll kill them. Wow, interesting. Uh, in the court of law today, uh, judges are humanized. Uh, just to give you this, if you ever have a court case over something you think you're going to quote Scripture, don't. Because the judges don't believe the Bible either. Most, so we do have some Christian judges, hallelujah. I'm saying 90% don't. If you're going to win a court case, you have to show a person's individual rights are being harmed to win that course case. You can't quote scripture anymore. They reject it. Boy, you say, preacher, we're so far from God. Yeah, but learn where we are. Learn where we are. Last year, a United States Marine was convicted and court-martialed at Camp Lugene, North Carolina for refusing to remove a Bible verse on her computer that said, no weapons formed against me shall prosper. I, have, I love the military, nothing against them, but they know that if they don't follow headquarters orders, they lose their position. And when you've been in for 18 years and you just got a few more years, that's your livelihood, man. It's hard to give up when you've stayed in that long. I believe the psalmist, as he goes on from verse 1 that we read, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God he goes on to say this, The Lord looked down from heaven, I think he's looking down at America, upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. And he says, they are all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Folks, let's not let that happen when God looks at us. Let's not let the tenets of humanism take over our mind. Let's say, God, I don't want to live by my selfish rights. I want to live and be responsible to you because of all that you've done for me. The fourth tenet says this, excuse me, the fourth point under tenet five says, we believe in maximum individual, huh, this is hilarious to me, 
autonomy consonant with social responsibility. <laughs> He's saying this, that the individual rights must harmonize with their culture. Duh! The humanists make the laws of our culture. And they're saying that you need to harmonize with your culture. No, sir. You need to harmonize with Almighty God. You see that? Wow. Thus they made themselves gods. And they do control most of the minds of most of the people. I, I, I say most of the minds. Right now, folks, I'll be honest with you, America's at a 50-50 balance. We're going to sink or swim this next election. I'm serious. We got two candidates that nobody likes. But we have two platforms that are different night and day. Don't vote candidate. Vote platform. Whether you like him or not. Did I say something wrong? Um, Hitler used the Bible to kill Jews. And justified it. The humanists totally reject the Bible and justify it. And Christians stand on the same platform with them. Somebody wake me up. Okay. Fifthly, although science can account for the causes of behavior, I just got to stop there. What a lie. Science says, their science says that man is good, basically good. He's born good and he becomes evil. That's anti-Bible right from the start. Every sentence they say is a lie. Isn't that amazing? Although science can account for the cause of behavior, the possibilities of individual freedom of choice exist in human life and should be increased. How evil. The humanist declares man's behavior is his choice. These humanists have already rejected God, rejected the Bible, rejected His Word, rejected truth, rejected light, rejected Christ, rejected morality. They've given themselves to pornography and fornication and every sinful act. And now they say that you should be able to increase your lifestyle wherever and whatever you want to do. Wow, you say, preacher, are they insane? No, they're humanists. Look at the sixth one real quickly, if you would. It says in the area, and, 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 and uh, moms and dads, if you've got some children here shouldn't be here, the next few are going to get real tough. So if you don't want them to hear, tell them to stick their fingers in their ears. Tell them to use some terminology. You may not want them to hear them. They're adults. You've got to hear it because of what's going on in our country. All right? In the area of sexuality, we believe that intolerant attitude, that's us. That's Christians. They're talking about us there often cultivated by orthodox religion, that's us. In Puranical cultures, pure, righteous living, that's us. Unduly repress sexual conduct. You got it? The problem is, those right-wing Christians, that's what they're saying. Wow. If we say anything against their lifestyle, we're wrong. Thus, they get to choose to live any ungodly, abominable way they wish. And if we call their lifestyle sinful, we're intolerant. You see that? We're the ones that's bigoted. We're the ones that's hate mongers. We're the ones that's prejudiced and narrow-minded because we're not broad-minded enough to let every filthy thing take place in our culture. Wow. That's how they believe. That's, thank God, that's not all the teachers in America, but it is over 80% of them. Thank God, that's not all the politicians in America, but it's the majority of them. Interesting. Secondly, the right to birth control, and this is going to blow some of you out of the water right here. Remember, this started in 1933, before birth control ever came on the scene. So what I say here is going to hit some of you in the nose, all right? So don't get mad at me. I'm just going to tell you the truth. 
The right to birth control, abortion, and divorce should be recognized while we do not approve of exploitive, denigrating forms of sexual expression. That's not an oxymoron. Neither do we wish to prohibit by law or social sanctions sexual behavior between consenting adults. So let me shock you with this. You have to remember that up until the, this, this tenet right here, 6-2, up to now, they've been teaching you everything is 100% go forward. Everything, every filthy, dirty, rotten lifestyle that you can think of, it's okay. Everything except being a Christian, all right, up to this point. Now, the Bible teaches something that they brought it out when they mentioned birth control. See, you weren't born, or you were born after birth control. And before birth control came on the scene, Isaiah 44, 2, God and preachers believe that God opened the womb and God shut the womb. And that's what preachers preach. Not only preachers, but any decent American believe that God opened the womb and shut the womb. You know, you say, why did grandma and grandpa have nine kids? They believed God opened the womb and shut the womb. They believed the greatest reward in the world is to have a child. And the humanists didn't like that. Go to the next slide. Matter of fact, the Bible says God opens the womb and shuts the womb. So the humanist came on the scene and said, look, the woman should have the right to decide if her body will conceive life or not. And Christians fought against that, said, no, 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 God has that right. So from birth control came abortion. The humanist idea behind abortion is if a woman can't stop the child from being conceived, she should have the right to stop the heart from beating. rather than take that awful 18 years responsibility of having to raise that child. Humanism. I believed it too when I was young. My preacher told me that was what was right. Interesting. Number three. The many varieties of sexual exploration should not in themselves be considered evil. <laughs> Without countenancing mindless permissiveness or unbridled promiscuity, a civilized society should be a tolerant one. Oh my word. The humanist here is trying to tell his humanistic students that there is something they shouldn't do. Isn't that nice of him? Now listen to what, the, what he's saying there. You've got to read this through a few times and then you'll see it. The reason this is amazing is because they have always expressed that the only evil thing up to now is God and the Bible and Christians. But the shocking thing is Tenet 6.3 says any type of sexual behavior from premarital relationships to homosexuality and all of its evil is okay because that's human behavior. Then they try to say, but, you know, in a nice way, we don't want to tell you not to do this, but we want to sort of put this in here, get ready for the word. We think rape is wrong. Now, I'm telling you that for this reason, because you're about to see that even though it is a wicked, horrible sin, it is swept under the carpet of nearly every university in America. Some proof. Uh, in the media, if you're watching news, how many cases do you hear of rape? Well, you know, preach, I think I heard three this year. In 2006, there were 300,000 rapes on the universities alone in our country, from Harvard to small community colleges. Of those 300,000, uh, only 12% were reported to the authorities. You say, why, preacher? Because the authorities would do nothing about it because it made their schools look bad. And of those 12% that were reported, only 17% were, were brought to court. And of those 17% that were brought to court, less than 1% were convicted. I, 
I've only read about it, hadn't talked to any women that's ever gone through that terrible, horrible sin. But if you do, you have to go down and expose yourself like a porno woman at the police department. You wonder why people don't want to even say it happened. And if you lived in the Middle East, it happens all the time. But you have to have two witnesses to testify that it happened to you. For if you accuse your husband or you accuse a man and you don't have two witnesses, you lose your head. It's a terrible world we live in, preacher. And I know it is. We're almost done. I think it's going to get better Sunday morning. Number four. Short of harming others or compelling them to do likewise, individuals should be permitted to express their sexual proclivities. That means they should be permitted to behave in the way they want to behave. And pursue their lifestyles as they desire. This tenet totally justifies the sin of homosexuality, which God calls an abomination. Your children for the past 20 years have been taught, even in grammar school, that homosexuality is simply an alternate lifestyle. And across the media, and across journalistic, humanistic magazines, anyone that would dare stand in a pulpit and call homosexuality a sin against God is a bigot. And a hate monger. And a homophobe. You've heard people call that, don't you? They want to make you look bad as they justify this horrible idea of humanism. So let me let the Bible speak for itself. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with womankind, both of them have committed an abomination. That means something filthy and dirty and repulsive. They have surely, they shall surely be put to death, God says. Their blood shall be upon them. Can't get much clearer than that. You say, preach that's the Old Testament. Glad you brought that up. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. Okay, fornicators, they've got to repent too. Idolaters, idolaters got to repent too. Adulterers, they've got to repent too. And so do the homosexuals, the infeminate. They've got to repent too. That's New Testament. Now look what the Lord says here. Paul says, As such, some were you. You were like that. But you've been blood, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and you don't do those things anymore. You see, what they're saying is I can live this lifestyle and still be a child of God. Paul says, uh-uh. Either you're in or you're out. One or the other. Okay. Uh, fifthly, this is the last one. We wish to cultivate the development of a responsible attitude towards sexuality. I laughed right there when I read that. Responsible attitude? I'll tell you what's responsible. One man for one woman until they die. That's responsible. Huh? Nobody on the side. No, I know, I know I'm supposed to say Concubines, but I thought of porcupines right there. No porcupines, you know. Well, maybe you do need a few porcupines. That might straighten you out after a while. Anyway, read on. <laughs> we wish to cultivate the development of a responsible attitude towards sexuality in which humans are not exploited. Exploited? Good night. As sexual objects and in which intimacy and sensitivity, respect and honesty... The devil's talking about respect and honesty here. Isn't that interesting? And interpersonal relationships are encouraged. Moral education for the children and adults is an important way of developing awareness and sexual maturity. And I wrote this. If that wasn't so filthy, it would be funny. It's letting the fox guard the hen house. It's letting a child molester babysit your kids. How can a person whose mind is corrupt with total immortality and humanism and a mind that rejects God's word as a base of truth have any idea to decide what is good and honest and responsible for you or me or my kids or grandkids? 
And yet that's who's governing our nation today. Wow. This is like letting the devil decide the standards for your life. For a man without God or the Bible to have the right to make decisions how a family or a Christian should live, it's abominable. To think or to allow them to make the rules of a nation control how your child will think in the future, how your child will be educated in the future, is like serving your child arsenic at her little tea party. It's poisoning her mind. I'd rather my child be poisoned with arsenic and die physically than let her mind be poisoned and she die and go to hell. And I actually put this in here. Let me end on a happy note. <laughs> that should have been the last one, I think. Thank God for Christians. Go to the next one, Mary. Thank God for Christian teachers. Thank God for Christian statesmen, not politicians. I don't like politicians because they change with the wind. But there are some statesmen, very few, but some out. Thank God for, thank God for Christian preachers across America. There's a lot of them, thousands of them that preach truth. Thank God for Christian families that stand for truth. Thank God for the Word of God we can build our life on. Thank God for them. And I, again, I think about 50% of America. I think it's in a balance, folks. I really do. And um, I don't think it's going to be so much how we vote in November. That's going to swing things one way or the other. I think it's how we've lived the past four, li four years. That's going to swing things one way or the other. And how we may determine to live the next four years. I believe that's the big thing. Again, I hope you understand humanism is a monster. It's not a three pound bass. It's a whale. And it's in your swimming pool in your backyard. And it's not that little cricket under your chair that you're scared of. It's an octopus under your bed with ten foot tentacles. And it's real. And we've been drinking of this fountain of filth all our lives. And that's why you've heard me say so, so often, please read the book. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. Live it. Whether you understand it or not, by faith, live it. Amen. For His glory. I like, I think Ray said this. I've heard other people say it. It's not the things I don't understand in the Bible that I have a difficult time living it's the things I do understand so if you understand the chapter on love live it you understand the kingdom attributes that we as Christians should live to reflect Christ Matthew 5 6 and 7 live it if you understand the importance of prayer then live it if you understand what it means to worship God in spirit and truth let's live those things we're in a war and I'm not happy with it. You know, I've been shot. You've been shot. My friends have been shot. Your friends, our kids are getting shot to pieces. Mom and dad, we're the generals. Let's say, God, I don't know a whole lot right now, but I'm, in the next little bit, I'm going to learn all I can so I can tell my family what's right and wrong. But more than tell them, I want to live it, that they may see Christ in me. Thank you, Father, for your word. I pray we'll realize that we're in a tremendous battle of our minds. And the devil is winning in a lot of ways. But God, you can have victory if we will sell out to you. And I just challenge all of us here, Lord. Let us be more motivated to love you and live for you. And honor you and bring glory to you. The lives we live and the way we worship than ever before. It may be our decision to draw nearer that may help change our family, and I know it will, Lord, our church, and maybe even our country. So, Lord, guide us, strengthen us.